Hi, welcome to Controller's Corner. I'm your host, Pat Curry, joined as always by Buffalo Controller Mark Schroeder. Our top story today, after auditing the payroll procedures of several city departments, Controller Schroeder is pushing for a more modern automated timekeeping system. Mark, you were looking to have a comprehensive fix to the timekeeping system because yep. when you are doing these audits, you're seeing the same findings and the same recommendations coming up again and again and again. And, yep. and your message is it's, it's time to step into the 21st century as far as how we pay our employees and how we keep track of their time, especially because personnel is the city's highest expense. Yeah, no question, Patrick. So to quote the, the great and famous and late Yogi Berra, deja vu all over again. That's exactly what has been happening with audit after audit after payroll audit in that it's a paper system. A paper system uh, is not good. It's not good for the taxpayers. Uh, actually, it's not good for employees. Uh, so therefore, uh, we are very interested in automation. Uh, as you pointed out, you know, technology is important and we really need to get up to speed on that. And so um, we, are, we plan on working uh, with the mayor and with the administration uh, on offering some ideas for automation. Now, on the 12th floor where the controller's office is, Audit and Control, uh, and MIS. Which the, is the city's IT department, handle the computers right. and the network. We are under a automation system. Uh, and so that was the beginning of a pilot program many, many years ago. But Patrick, it's never been completed. We need to complete it right now. And so as the Buffalo City Controller, uh, the thing that would make me most nervous is that awful word that begins with F, fraud. And so fraud is not good for the taxpayers of Buffalo, and it's not good uh, for employees. So the, if there is not a comprehensive automated system, um, then employees pretty much can say and do whatever they want to uh, within a paper system. And it's not right. It's not right for the taxpayers, and it's not right for our employees. We need to have a system in place, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful that over the next several months we will be able to put forth a plan uh, that actually makes sense. Now, you mentioned the pilot program in your office, and, and the employees in Audit Control and the MIS department, they scan their hands into a biometric sensor, right. which uh, records when they come in the morning or when they leave in the afternoon. You're looking for something uh, that embraces that technology for citywide programs, so we're not relying on a paper sign-in sheet. It, it, it's a it's something where somebody can't punch in for someone else or right. or write in the wrong time yeah. or even a mistake would be made. But this would be a system that tracks automatically each person and when they come and when they leave. And, yeah. and it's a more accurate way to do this. It, so no, the no, city's tax no question it. about it. Um, you know, when I was an Erie County legislator uh, back in 2002, 3 and 4, uh, the county embarked on a new system. It was called an SAP system. It would be similar to the city system of Munis. And when the county did that, they incorporated automation into the payroll. Uh, and so, um, really, the city of Buffalo back then, Patrick, when Munis was first introduced in 2000 or so, that's the time um, that we should have had a vendor um, that would know how to work with the Munis Tyler system and put in a comprehensive uh, payroll automated system. That wasn't done, um, but now we have an opportunity to do it. We should do it, uh, and we will do it. Now, this is something that you can't do unilaterally. You need the cooperation of uh, the mayor and the council on this, and, and you're hoping that uh, they will join you in, in order to protect the city's finances and our largest expense. Yeah, no, no question about that. But at the, at the end of the day, the problem is that the system that we have right now is kind of a makeshift system. It was put forth by employees uh, in Audit and Control and, and MIS and some vendor who no, no longer is even operating anymore in the city of Buffalo. So there's a what if. What if the system crashes, the system that we have now, even though it's a paper system? Um, at the end of the day, 
nobody, uh, the mayor and the council members, they, they, don't want, they don't want to be in a place that you're unable to pay your employees, mm -hmm. right? And so therefore, I expect full cooperation uh, from the mayor uh, and or the Buffalo Common Council. But at the end of the day, um, I will tell you, we are going to put forth an automated system. And if we have to do it ourselves uh, in the controller's office, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so there's no votes on this. We are going to try to do it in a way that makes sense and brings bring in everybody because it could be a quite an expensive and a long process. Uh, but in the end, it will save the taxpayers money. I'm convinced of it. That's the reason why New York State has a system. That's the reason why Erie County has a comprehensive system. And they have more employees and more buildings than we have. They have full automation. That's what the city of Buffalo needs. That's what the city of Buffalo will be getting shortly. And since you did work for the state as an assemblyman and you worked in the county legislature, you have some experience in how other governments can, can uh, track their employees' time and you can use the best of from what you've seen in other governments to help the city of Buffalo. No, no question about it. And, and I have taken um, the initiative to reach out uh, to certain experts uh, who I know in state government uh, and in county government uh, to ask for their help, uh, for their guidance, for their observations. Uh, and Ann Forty Sherino and I, my first deputy, uh, we met with some folks from the county uh, last week and they were very helpful to us. So we're very confident uh, that going, going forward, uh, this is gonna be something um, that we're gonna be able to do and we're gonna be able to do it in short order. Now, speaking of your experience as a state assemblyman, your successor as an assemblyman is Michael Kearns, Mickey, as he's known. And you joined Mickey last week in a press conference calling out banks to stop the incomplete foreclosures that leave these zombie houses yeah. in neighborhoods yeah. and, and they have overgrown lots and the houses are in disrepair. And it's become a real blight on many neighborhoods of hardworking people who take care of their property. Now you joined Mickey uh, Kearns, uh, the assemblyman, yeah. at a press conference on Germania Street last week yep. just to call out, in this case it was HSBC, on finishing this foreclosure process and not leaving these homes in legal limbo where really no one is taking care of the homes. Yeah, I, I don't get involved in things that don't have to do with me or my office. Uh, but in this particular case, um, I have worked with some of the district council members, uh, the former Majority Leader Damone Smith. This was an issue f that he had. Uh, Councilman Franzik from Fillmore, uh, Councilman uh, Chris Scanlon from South Buffalo, and then Assemblyman Mickey Kearns uh, has been at the forefront of this issue. I've worked with Community Action Organization L. Nathan Hare. Uh, I've worked with Patty McDonald from Project Slumlord. So so I understand how one house ruins it for everybody in the neighborhood. And so therefore, uh, when I talked to Assemblyman Kearns, I said, listen, I don't get involved in issues that really don't make sense for a Buffalo City Controller, but I can tell you, Assemblyman Kearns, um, there are three banks, uh, three major banks that the City of Buffalo does business with. If they are not being good neighbors, then I'm gonna have something to say about it. Uh, and so, so far, uh, the assemblyman hasn't given me any indication that the banks that we do most of our business with are involved in a negative way um, with these foreclos for foreclosures. Uh, but once I hear about it, Patrick, you know uh, that we know how to use the hammer. We've done it before. Uh, you've done that before with J.P. Morgan Chase. Yep. Uh, there was a great deal of mismanagement, and they were fined heavily by the uh, federal government for yep. some of their uh, misdeeds uh, in your first year as controller. Yes. And you pulled $45 million out of an account with J.P. Morgan Chase and put it into First Niagara, a local bank, just to send them a message that you're watching them, yep. and if they're not doing good practices, you're not going to hesitate to take that money out and do business elsewhere. Yeah, and, that, and that's the reason why I felt it's important for the Buffalo City Controller to join Assemblyman Kearns and others throughout the city of Buffalo 
Uh, and so uh, my offer to the assemblyman was that I'm happy to bring in the three major banks that we do business with and not threaten them, just say, listen, we want to bring you here to the table. Uh, the assembly member and the council members have concerns. Uh, these are concerns around our city where these mortgage foreclosed properties are ruining the neighborhood and so we we would expect you to stand up uh, and to be helpful and there's other groups Patrick there's the Push Buffalo who have been very very helpful uh, there's the Western New York Law um, group that has been I forget what their formal name is they, they've been very very helpful uh, in in litigating some of this uh, some of these problems throughout the city so yeah this is something that we're gonna be in full uh, pursuit of and it's the right thing to do so not only are you uh, threatening the hammer of taking the money away for uh, city's money away from some of these banks if they're not being good neighbors but you're also trying to use your uh, relationship with these banks in order to foster a new dialogue with these community groups and other leaders that are trying to fight this yeah. incomplete foreclosure problem. Yep. And, and so it's really a dual approach, you know, the carrot and the stick. Yep. You'll help them if it, you'll help the community meet with these banks and use your relationship to do that. But if these banks still aren't going to be a good neighbor, you can you can use uh, your authority to to hurt them where it counts. In Ex the, in the, in the exactly. Bank. That's exactly what we're going to do. So. All right, Mark. Well, we have to take a quick break. When I get back, I want to talk to you about the mission statement workshops that you have with Franklin Covey's uh, Gary Magui. Okay, perfect. State this message. Are you unemployed, underemployed, or do you need to improve your job skills? Then the Buffalo Employment and Training Center is here for you. The Buffalo Employment and Training Center is your one-stop employment shop. Whether you need help with your search, access to information, seminars, or training, our expert and caring staff is here for you. And the best part is, all of our services are free. The Buffalo Employment and Training Center is conveniently located at 77 Goodell Street in downtown Buffalo with plenty of free parking. For more information, call 856-JOBS or visit us on the web at www.workforcebuffalo.org. Hi, welcome back to Controller's Corner. I'm your host, Pat Curry, joined as always by Buffalo Controller Mark Schroeder. The Controller has enlisted the help of Franklin Covey's Gary Magui, a world-renowned facilitator and public speaker, in order to help his department craft a new mission statement. Now, Mark, you have a long relationship with Gary Magui. He works for Franklin Covey, right. which uh, he gives presentations on the seven habits of effective people. You actually brought him in to do a lecture on the seven habits yep. earlier this year, but now you, you've enlisted him, and he's doing this uh, free of charge yep. to taxpayers. To the city. You've enlisted his help in crafting a new mission statement that inspires and empowers your employees to, uh, to meet the goals that are so important to them and to taxpayers. Yeah, absolutely, Patrick. I think a lot of it has to do with what my background was. I was in a private sector for 25 years. Therefore, in the late 1980s, I was very aware of Dr. Stephen Covey and the book he wrote, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He sold 19 million copies. They then transformed that program to also help failing schools. Uh, so over the years, I've had a real interest in connecting with the Franklin Covey people. So Gary Magui uh, is my friend. He came in and did a lecture some time ago. But most importantly, he knows that I've tried. We've tried. My Deputy uh, Ann Forty Sherino and us, we have tried uh, to put forth uh, a strategic plan and also a mission statement. And we've done a good job. Uh, quite frankly, um, the Buffalo elected controllers go back to 1848, and I can assure you no other controller has ever tried this before. Uh, so we're doing it, and we've, we've done well with it. However, um, we have taken a new approach. We believe that every single employee, doesn't matter what their title is, it doesn't matter if they're an accountant or clerical, it doesn't matter. We want them in the room. We want them to hear from a professional like Gary Magui. And now what we're doing is we've established eight or nine people from each of the divisions I'm responsible for. And these employees are actually gonna write drafts of our mission statement. What's our mission and why? 
And so I'm very excited about it. Um, when we had our first meeting, I'm never sure, really, how's it going to go? I mean, are people are going to be like, what is this control out of his mind? What's he trying to do? It was the complete opposite. I think people want to be empowered to be able to say what they do and then at the end of the day have some say in what our mission is and what ultimately our vision is long term. So I'm excited about it. It's working, Patrick. It's working. Now, one of the things that's so important is that the employees are included in this process and, and that's so they're invested in it. And Gary often says that too often mission statements become framed whatevers. It's yeah. something that sounds nice and they put it up on a wall, but the employees really don't live it. So one of the things that he's working with your staff is, is not only to have everyone be included in drafting this, but then to put make it concrete language and that they live it every day and that they be able to recite it and it, it's a part of what they do and they're living that every day they show up to work. Yeah, no no question about it. And the our employees understand that. Our employees uh, are looking forward uh, to some of the visits uh, that we're going to be having with Gary McGooey over the next couple of months and we are fully prepared and ready. Uh, by January 1st, 2016, we will have a mission statement uh, put forth by our employees uh, and it's not going to be one of those mission statements that are just going to bookcase. They're going to know it, they're going to live it, and uh, we're excited about it. And the employees are very excited about this program. And, and you, you, Gary McGooey hosted two workshops last week, and the engagement of the employees, they were talking together and, and working together, and they seemed really enthusiastic about this new initiative and, and uh, very uh, enthusiastic about continuing this and crafting something that we can be proud of as a department. Yeah, so this is something that, that we're going to look forward to, me and you, Patrick, in talking to uh, the viewers of Buffalo because this is an opportunity uh, that we're excited about and, and more importantly than me being excited about it, uh, for our employees to be excited about this because they serve the citizens of Buffalo is the key and that's why I'm, uh, I'm grateful for them and for their enthusiasm uh, you know, in this project. So we, we had an employee there who had remembered the mission statement when she worked for an airline. Uh, and this many years later, she still memorizes. So that's the kind of impact you want your mission statement to have, yeah. dear employees. Years from now, they'll always remember what that mission statement was, and they'll live it. Yeah, and one, one of those persons is actually on the writing committee, so I hope we have a mission statement that doesn't talk about Delta. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, changing gears a little bit, um, the Buffalo Public School System just hired a new superintendent, uh, Kreiner Cash, and you had an opportunity to sit down with uh, Superintendent Cash yeah. And, and discuss uh, your role with the city's uh, public schools and your hopes for their success in the future. Yeah, so so I had a, um, a very, very nice visit with him, Dr. Kreiner Cash, and he is uh, very, uh, I think he's, I think he understands that he's got a important mission here. So when I can, re I remember when I met with him, he kind of wanted to get talking right away about the schools. And I wanted to slow him down a little bit and because I wanted to really get to know him a little bit. So, so I said to him, I said, Dr. Kreiner Cash. Kreiner, that name, it's kind of like a, is that a German name? And in German, it means curled or frizzy. And then he starts laughing. He says, look at my frizzy hair. And then he went on about his mother, who is Pennsylvania Dutch from du Dubois, Pennsylvania. That's exactly what, what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of get a feel for who he is. Mm -hmm. and, and he has great passion uh, for his family. And, uh, and so now he's here in Buffalo. And so I've, the, the reason why I'm encouraged by him is that after I got to know him a little bit and he talked about his family and where he's from, and, and then we got more uh, into the Buffalo Public Schools and there's an old adage that the 3M company used to use plan your work work your plan and I believe that's exactly what Dr. Kreiner Cash is doing he has identified what the most important priorities are and he is going to begin to work with the elected school board members and the administrators and teachers and staff uh, so I have a good feeling about this uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that he's very, very successful uh, because the number one reason is that this is this is really for our children. This is for the students uh, of Buffalo, and we need real leadership right now. And uh, and and I'm grateful that we have Dr. Cash, and I wish him well. 
And if people have more confidence in the city school system, they'd be more confident in moving into the city of Buffalo and staying there and raising their family. Often, too often, you see people move out to the suburbs for schools. But if the city of Buffalo uh, could fix some of the issues that they're having in their school system, it could only help Buffalo in the long run and help those socioeconomics that you often so talk about, yep. uh, especially with the rating agencies. Yeah, there's no, there's no question about it. And so the priority right now is for Dr. Uh, cash to hit the ground running he is and to work uh, with everybody within the the city of Buffalo uh, to have the best product we can have in our schools and uh, you know I'm, I'm a proud alumni of the Buffalo Public Schools and As so are I. you and so we 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 have a great history and there's no reason we've had a couple bumps along the road okay I get it but now it's time to fix it and uh, and and I'm hopeful that that's exactly what we're going to do over the, over the little period of time coming up. Now, speaking of schools, as a young man, you were very active at St. Mary's School for the Deaf. Yeah. Um, and you know sign language. Yeah. You've used it yeah, on well, the floor. I'm rusty. I'm rusty, Pat. <laughs> you used it on the floor to the assembly, and you're very passionate about um, deaf awareness. And this month is Deaf Awareness Month. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that um, campaign and, and what you've been doing to help raise the awareness about Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so many, many years ago, I uh, worked at St. Mary's School for the Deaf, and I tell people I still use old signs because I am old. It usually gets a laugh when I'm with the older, uh, my older friends of the deaf community. Uh, but deaf awareness is a very, very important thing. It started about 1958 or so, and I've gone to these functions in, in the city of Buffalo over the last three or four years, and I often talk about the history of deaf awareness, and I've talked about the unemployment rate of the deaf uh, community within Buffalo and New York State. But this year, I chose to talk about deaf awareness of how it makes a difference for not only deaf people. If it wasn't for St. Mary's School for the Deaf, I will assure you I wouldn't be in the position I'm in right now. Uh, I would not have been in the private sector uh, because the sisters of, of, of St. Mary's School for the Deaf, they gave me a reference that got me the job I wanted, I needed. I wanted this job in the private sector. And Sister Tecla Joseph, God bless her, she said to John McCarthy uh, when he was doing the interview process with her, Sister Tecla said, and Mr. McCarthy, uh, if you don't hire Mark Schroeder, there probably won't be a place for you in heaven. <laughs> well, John McCarthy panicked, a nice Irish kid, right, from Boston, and so I got hired. Uh, but Sister Tecla from St. Mary's School for the Deaf and my other friends, um, not only have they helped the deaf community, but they have helped people like me and others uh, to be the best that we can be within our community. And so I am very grateful to the deaf community. Um, I, I had a deaf person in our office uh, today trying to help him with some employment possibilities that he's interested in. Uh, so I have a very close relationship with them. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of deaf awareness, and I'm so grateful that they gave me an opportunity to participate with them. And with, you mentioned employment, you, and with the technology nowadays, it's much easier for uh, someone with a hearing impaired to get into the workforce and, and work to their maximum potential with all, all the different options out there technologically. You would think so. It's not, it's, it's not catching up to the technology yet. Um, but I think it will, and be, because a lot of my deaf friends, they obviously have cell phones, um, and they're using it for emailing and for texting and things of that nature, video mm -hmm. um, capability on the phone. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you you would think that, but uh, you know, Governor David Patterson, he used very high uh, deaf unemployment numbers uh, in our in our state. So it's it's logical to what you said, but we need to catch up to the technology to give all people especially uh, hearing impaired or deaf uh, people an opportunity to work. Now, in addition to Deaf Awareness Month, it's also Hispanic Heritage Month. Now, you were there at the kickoff of Hispanic Heritage Month. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little about that event and, and what this month is. Yeah, I, I've had a very close relationship with the Hispanic Heritage Council of Western New York, and they, they are dear, dear people, and they are keeping their tradition alive, the Latino uh, tradition alive. But they do it in a very unique way that they bring 
everybody in. They bring everybody in to participate and to understand uh, to what their mission is. And their mission is really to help everybody. And so we had a, a parade that we participated in, the Puerto Rican Hispanic Parade, and I was able to do the salsa all moving all the way up Niagara Street. In the pouring rain. In the pouring <laughs> rain, but it didn't matter. And uh, but. But really what's important is, is from the cultural standpoint. And, uh, and they have a display, a beautiful display. Uh, Hispanics, mostly Puerto Rican people, came to Western New York in the 1890s, 1900s. Uh, most of them were working in the fields and canneries in Southern Erie County, in Dunkirk, in uh, Chautauqua County. Uh, but they always wanted better for their family. And even though they weren't making a lot of money, they always sent money home to mother. And, uh, and so I, I, all the ethnic groups that came to Buffalo did that, Polish, German, Irish, uh, and the Hispanic community is the same. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a beautiful month. Uh, the significance of it, Patrick, is September, October, there were over nine Latino countries who earned their independence during the month of September, October. So that is the reason why uh, the Hispanic Heritage Council uses September 15th to October 15th. Uh, so I'm looking forward to joining them uh, for more events over the next couple of weeks. Now, another event that you participated in was Project Homeless Connect. That's a way to uh, raise awareness and help homeless people in the city of Buffalo. Tell us a little about that effort and, and what you did at that event. Yeah, um, th this is a tremendous event. These are people like Jimmy Folan uh, and Kathleen Heim, uh, Dale Sulkowski, former council member. Uh, and so what they do is they bring the homeless community into the Buffalo Convention Center and they get over 130 different vendors who can help them all at one time. Uh, uh, and it's very organized. Uh, the, 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 the participants come in, they sign up, they make it clear to what they're looking for that day. Uh, and, and chances are there's going to be a vendor that's going to be able to help them and their family. Uh, it was extremely successful. It's the sixth annual event that took place at the Buffalo Convention Center last week. Uh, and I just want to congratulate uh, the Homeless Alliance and all of the different vendors across uh, Erie County and Western New York who are helping the most vulnerable people uh, in our community get their second chance and be able to help themselves and to be able to help their families. And for all the talk about combating poverty, this is the front lines to combating poverty in our city is helping people uh, who are homeless and are having a difficult time. No, no question about it. And the, the, this, you brought up the term before socioeconomics. The rating agencies are looking at this. So every time we're able to help uh, another boat rise, that is what the rating agencies are looking for because that then puts us maybe in a different and a higher rating category once we're able to accomplish giving people an opportunity to help themselves. And so it's, a, uh, it's going to be a long, arduous project uh, over, over the next several years, but we've got great partners who are doing the right thing and are trying to help people and their families. Well, Mark, that's all the time we got for Controller's Corner. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And thanks for joining us at home. Make sure to check out the controller's website at city-buffalo.com slash controller. Check out our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, and our Twitter handle. On behalf of controller Mark Schroeder, this is Pat Curry signing off.